This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Smallmouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Smallmouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Big smallmouth, top anglers across the country, all kinds of good information. If you want to learn how to catch big smallmouth, this is the podcast for you. Also, on my YouTube channel, Smallmouth Crush, for those viewing this interview setting, we got a great guest, a river angler, one of the top smallmouth river anglers in the country. And we got a lot of questions for this guy. Joe Raymond is going to be joining me shortly. Before we get into that, let's talk about the real shot. It's quickly becoming the top tackle shop for all the smallmouth crush fans out there. Top brands, anything and everything you're looking for. You guys know the drill. Z-Man, Evergreen, Daiwa, Lucky Craft, Mega Bass. The list goes on and on. St. Croix rods, rods and reels, everything a smallmouth bass angler could ask for. www.therealshot.com. Use my Como, Como? I didn't say that right. Use my promo. For a second, I was wondering if I said a bad word. Como. Use my promo code SMALLMOUTHCRUSH15 and get 15% off your order. Without further ado, let's bring our guest. What's up? What's going on there, Joseph? Do you go by Joseph or Joe? Joe. Okay, Joe. Yep. Joe, rumor has it. Rumor has it you know how to catch. He just went blank. Security, what happened? started I, t- I i a call came in so okay that or not let's not have that happen again here how do you do it i mean i can't put it on uh airplane well, phone's been blowing up all day you got a good point joe where was i going with this you know how to catch a big small mouth rumor, in some rumor. crazy places what is the rumor that's just that you like to go shallow yeah we go uh I, I guess for the guys that don't know, I yeah, guy, introduce yourself, Joe. Tell us a little bit about your background. My name's Joe Raymond. I am the Susquehanna smallmouth guide for anybody that's on social media might recognize the name. I uh, guide on the Susquehanna river, uh, shallow water specific out of jet boats. I run a rock proof boat. been doing it for a number of years now. I, I guess I got into it and t- around 2012 2013 when i got my first rock proof boat um and just really kind of went from being you know a weekend guy a weekend fisherman weekend guide i was just kind of doing it on the side uh i had a good job uh i was in you know plumbing really plumbing and pipe fitting and i just kind of got the you know got the shits of getting up early every day to go work for the man and so Mm. on go do something on my own. So I've been doing it full time, uh, guiding full time on the Susquehanna since 2016. And so far it's proven to be probably one of the best, best decisions I've made. Yeah. Right. So hours and hours of fishing, almost just logging hours and hours and hours, uh, pretty much daily. Yeah. For a while there, I was doing it daily. I mean, when the fishing was good, I, you know, I, I would go into every year and just say, I'm going to maybe, you know, I just want to do it five days a week. I want this to be a normal job, but then it turns into, you know, if you post pictures on social media, you know, people get the itch and I just kept filling everything up. So I know there was times where, you know, you go two months in a row of pretty much no days off the river and no days off the water. And it's crazy, but you know, for the people, I know the average person can't do this, but the amount of information, I mean, you just can't learn like that any other way other than time on the water, like mm-hmm. logging those, those hours. Sorry. Stuff keeps popping up on my phone. No, that's fine. Uh, I, we, we do want to get into it. You, you've, uh, 
started expanding your guide service a little bit up on the St. Lawrence River recently too, and we certainly want to touch on that. But let's focus really on on River Smallmouth. So the Susquehanna River. And by the way, I like your T-shirt for all the viewers that are all the listeners. Represent. He's got the Smallmouth Crush uh, T-shirt on. So you must be a Smallmouth Crush fan. We certainly appreciate the support, Joe. Susquehanna River, man, talk about it. Thing runs like from New York down to where? Uh, down into Maryland. It's a monstrous river. I believe it drains out. I knew all the numbers. I think it's 27,000 square miles of drainage, 460 miles long. Um, hmm. One of the largest tributary, I think it's the largest tributary into the Chesapeake Bay. It provides the Chesapeake Bay with 60% of its water. Um, it's just a massive river. And at, at one time, and probably still, you know, it, it's one of the best smallmouth bass fisheries in terms of numbers in the country, maybe mm -hmm. not size, you know, with moving around and seeing different stuff, there's definitely competitors to it, but there was a time just a few years ago where the numbers of smallmouth bass in that river river were just unbelievable. And it's still really good. You know, like everything, it kind of goes through it's, it's ups and it's downs, but uh, for the most part, it's shallow water specific, fishing like fishing in most of the time i'm fishing in three feet of water or less it's mm. th those those smallmouth they go where the food is at and the food you know they're feeding on crayfish they're feeding on bait fish they're feeding on bugs and um you know that's where you catch them that's where you get them is there other rivers around the country that you're familiar with that are similar to uh to that system because i'm just curious you know the majority of that river you need a jet boat because you know a fiberglass boat would get damaged and ruined Correct. um there's got to be other other areas i'm just curious you know for maybe a, a listener that's from another part of the country you know i'm sure there's going to be a lot of yeah techniques that we'll get into that they can utilize on their own body of water as well especially a river setting yes. whether that be wading a creek or a jet boat or even a river where you can take a fiberglass boat, a lot of these tips will come into play right. because you run into all kinds of different scenarios on that river. There is some places where the bank is five feet to your right and five feet to your left, and you're taking a boat up to some of these some of these spots, correct? Yeah. So what other bodies of water resemble that? Um, I mean, the Susquehanna is a monster. It's a big river, but, you know, any river that, uh, you know, moving water, sh shallow water, uh, the Juniata River would be similar, but that's, you know, another river local to this area. Um, mm -hmm. Does I, that connect? I, I, I'm sorry if I sh maybe should know this. Does that connect to the Susquehanna? Yeah, the Juniata is actually one of the largest tributaries to the Susquehanna River. And the Juniata River is a special, special river in itself. And it has really big, it's got some of the biggest smallmouth in PA that I've caught have come out of the Juniata River. Mm. It's it's a really neat place. I mean, that would be th that would fish very similar to the Susquehanna. But yeah, any shallow, you know, natural flowing river that has smallmouth in it, these techniques that I use on the Susquehanna should work where you're mm -hmm. at. I know a lot of guys travel up into Maine and fish the Penobscot River. That would be similar. Uh, the Susquehanna is unique though in the sense that where I fish, it's all natural flow. Like for the most part dams like power releases aren't dictating the flow this is natural flow what's coming down the river is the runoff or you know what's coming mm -hmm. out of all the tributary thing like that so it runs very stable so depending on where these guys are at in different parts of the country there are going to be more variables you know to piecing together the bite i know like down south in georgia uh tennessee there's all kinds of rivers down there that have smallmouth and shoal bass that you know, the way that I fish for smallmouth in the Susquehanna will work down there, but you're also going to want to know your generation schedules out of the power plant to really kind of piece everything together. The Susquehanna is nice in the sense that it has, um, you know, just a natural flow. So you don't got to worry about, you know, are they showing up and wondering, are they going to be running water today? Because there's always, you can pretty much look at a gauge. Like I will use, uh, if you Google river gauges, um, for your local river, most rivers have gauges. And, you know, if you're not familiar with fishing rivers, 
you need to get tuned into that. You need to get tuned into even the very first time you go and you fish, you know, your local flow, find out if it has river gauges and find out what level that river was at when you fished it, because you might plan on going back there, you know, a month later and you show up and it looks completely different. It might be really high. It might be really low. And that's, um, you know, kind of, it's going to change what you do, you know, how you approach that. So if you have a log or if you can just kind of remember water levels at one particular gauge, you know, just because a gauge reads four feet at one spot, doesn't mean if there's another gauge 10 miles up river, it's going to read the same level, but you just want to pick a gauge and always use that. Like at, for where I fish on the Susquehanna, I'm main, mainly looking at the, the Harrisburg gauge, but guys are going to want to, you know, start paying attention to that. I noticed just with talking to different people across you know, different parts in the different parts of the country that they know nothing about the river gauges. And I mean, that's just a huge part of, you know, the river level is really going to dictate where those fish are at, whether they're on the bank at a high level or, you know, when the water level drops, they're going to pull out into the, you know, mid river structure, whether it's, you know, rocks, ledges, uh, you know, gravel bars, you know, different mm -hmm. stuff grass beds so. right so as a river angler what do you think your strengths are when it comes to smallmouth fishing what makes you so successful being able to target these fish and stay on top of them just time on the water i mean getting getting back into that you can read and read and read and watch different stuff on the internet and talk with people and it all helps but if you want to get really good and really start, you know, being able to figure things out on your own, there's no better way to do it than to just get out there, get some comp, get some, get some, get baits that you know are going to catch fish. Mm -hmm. And you know, I use Z-Man for the most part. You know, if you have confidence lures that you know, if you get around fish, you're going to catch them. Um, that's the most important things, you know, mm -hmm. just spending the time on the water and having those confidence baits for me, it's swim baits, Ned rigs. Um, generally, you know, we throw more of that stuff than anything, but if the water is up, you know, and it's got a little bit of stain in it, spinner baits, um, uh, the kind that you can burn real fast. So chatter baits also, you know, chatter baits are great and, and dirtier water for smallmouth, um, crank baits, you know, different stuff like that. But, I guess what's made me successful is having, it's hard to put the pieces together if you're not getting bites. And the Susquehanna for so long was jammed full of fish. And I mean, you could really piece everything together by having, you know, putting time in on the water. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for guys, you know, if you, if you have somebody you can trust, you know, different parts of the country that can lead you to a, a good area to at least go and start putting something together and really just piecing it together and, and finding out what works. But I guess that's if you time on the water, that's that's really what does it. And, you know, I guess when I was younger, I always I grew up splashing around in creeks and streams and, you know, understanding, you know, the way that water moves and like uh, where fish might be hiding out. I guess it's just, it's, it's kind of something that's embedded in me just by what I did when I was younger, just kind of growing up in that environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot that goes into it, obviously. So I, I, I'm looking to go a little deeper into this cause we gotta, we gotta help people out that may want to start fishing rivers for smallmouth, and they don't have the time on the water. So where do they start? What, what, what should they be looking for? So let's take a normal summertime pattern with so, normal water levels. Yeah. And nor, if you're talking about river fishing over the summer and a shallow, you know, rocky river, similar to the Susquehanna, you're going to want to go, you're going to want to get around fast water, especially if your water temperature is real warm, the fast, you know, um, rapidy type of areas that's going to have the most oxygen in the water. And I kind of feel like those areas, you know, with all the water moving, it almost, you know, for us on a hot day, it's like you want a little bit of a breeze, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to be around those areas and you just want to take these confidence lures, whether, you know, a swim bait, get, get a 
Z-Man Diesel Minnow or a Minnow Z. Here's one right here. And I just have it on a little jig head. Uh, that's a quarter ounce. I don't know if I'd recommend going that heavy in real shallow water, maybe an eighth ounce. But, you know, tie something like that on and just start fan cast it around. Mm -hmm. You know, current shoots, eddies, pockets. You know, if there's boulders sticking out and you have a nice, you know, backed up water area where you see, I guess the people might not even know how to recognize an eddy or a pocket. And this is something, you know, you're going to have to learn and understand. Um, with the moving water, you always, it's easy to identify moving water by watching bubbles on the surface. You know, the bubbles moving, that's going to show you where the water's moving, obviously. Um, when you get into an area where the bubbles are just kind of sitting still or maybe circling around a, a little bit, that's an eddy or a pocket. And those fish, sometimes they're in that pocket area, sometimes they're on the current line, and sometimes they're off that current line actually in the current you know they move back and forth in and out uh throughout the day like i would imagine in the morning in the evenings they're feeding heavier and they're going to be just right out in the current a little bit but you, if you start seeing this type of stuff you know you get out on the river you start picking it apart you just want to fan cast across all that stuff whether it's a swim bait uh spinner bait top water lures uh a whopper plopper you know something mm -hmm. like that buzz bait throw it up into there into these areas and if there's smallmouth around if you you you're gonna get bit if you don't get bit then you need to just keep moving and moving and moving and moving i don't spend i won't spend all day in one spot you know if you're talking over the summer or whatever in these you know fast water areas you have a big ledge ledge section or whatever that goes from bank to bank whether you're in a boat, a kayak, or waiting, you know, you just want to move, you know, from one side to the other and really pick it apart, you know, pick the whole thing apart, dissect that, you know, one section and just kind of remember where you got the bites. You know, if you throw up into an area and you get a blow up or, you know, you have a fish on, just make a mental note, you know, you might cast up in there a couple more times and not catch a fish right away. Mm-hmm move, you know, let that fish reset and come back a little while later, you know, come back the next day, but just always make those mental notes too, for, you know, where you got the bites, because there might be something special going on there. Right. So a lot of conditions we talked about, you know, river system that's changing every day, probably more so than a lake. Okay. You yeah. still have, you have moving water, you have rising, falling water based on dams or perhaps rainfall right. drought conditions. You're still going to deal with wind like we do on natural lakes. You might yep. have a day where it blows like crazy. And, yep. uh, current, obviously, is, is going to be the biggest thing to look at. Always, what do you do? Go ahead. You're always going to want to look for the current, obviously. But go, yeah, go ahead. What do you do when we get some conditions that are not ideal? You know, a lot of times we can't pick our days when we're going to go fishing. We plan in advance. So I'm planning for a future Saturday, two weeks away, and that Wednesday before – we get an inch of rain and it dirties up the river and maybe even increases the, uh, you know, the water flow. And of course, maybe we have a little bit higher water than expected. What do you do? Do you still fish in that dirty water? Uh, it depends on how much every river is going to be different in this regard. The Susquehanna fortunately is big enough that it takes a pretty significant rain event to do, to make a, a big impact. Um, you know, if the river's running gorgeous and you have this trip, if you are reading the gauges and everything looks good, like it was the last time you were there, you know, you're comfortable. And then all of a sudden rain pops up into the forecast. Um, I mean, you kind of got to pick it apart as it goes, but depending on when the rain falls, you know, relative to your trip, like say you have a trip planned on Saturday and it rains real hard on Wednesday, there's a mm -hmm. chance that mud by the time you get there on Saturday is going to have worked itself. Basically the way that these rivers dirty up, it doesn't just rain and it gets dirty immediately. It rains throughout the watershed and it dirties up the tributaries first and the tributaries start dumping that dirty water along the bank. So that's the first thing that's going to dirty up. And then as time goes on, all that dirty water moves the whole way across the river. Mm -hmm. 
you're talking about being out a couple of days, you might get there and it'll be dirty the whole way across the river. But then as it starts to clean up, it's going to be the same deal where those tributaries clean out first and that clean water is going to start pushing in, you know, from the banks. So it's going to, you're going to have the clean water kind of pushing in like that. So, you know, if you get to the, if something like that happens, you just want to get to the river, depending on how wide it is and, you know, pick your launch and run across and look at the water clarity, the whole way across the river as you're going and try and find out, is there a clean water line or a cleaner water line or, you know, just greener water anywhere. And then just kind of gauge at how far that cleaner water line is off the bank. And then just think of structure that would be in that water line, you know, up river, down river stuff that you might be able to fish, but you know, that should help guys out a lot. So do these fish go into the dirty water or do they prefer the clean water? If they have a choice, if they have a smallmouth, definitely favor clean, clear water, mm-hmm. but you can catch them in dirty water. Um, but if it's like what you were saying, where it, half the river's dirty and half's not, you for, would concentrate on a clean water first. Water, yeah, definitely look for the cleaner water. Not saying you won't catch fish in the dirty water, but there's different baits. You know, if, if what's if a good dirty in, water bait? A chatter bait chatter baits are awesome in dirty water you know you just throw them out there throw them against the bank or throw them with you know close to whatever structure you think might look fishy and just slow roll it back in you know darker colors black and blue green pumpkin uh, we've also had really good luck on bright colors though on chatter baits dirty water you know white white and chartreuse you know gold blade stuff like that crank baits work really good in dirty water you know a square bill or something like that but if the river, you know, if I ran across and I, you know, one side's dirty, one side's, cl- you know, cleaner, looks better, I would definitely start fishing that better looking water first. And, you know, if it doesn't pan out, maybe I would go into some of that. Basically, I'd go to what I, you know, the areas that I had the most confidence in, in that dirty water section and throw those baits, you know, the there's definitely certain areas as guys you'll find, you know, you spend a lot of time on a river, you'll know the fishy areas, you know, that those areas that just historically always have fish around them. So, you know, you get, if you're going to go screw around in the dirty water, definitely go to where you have the most confidence and throw, you know, bait, like a chatter bait, you know, Mm -hmm. three, you know, three eighths, maybe even a half ounce, Uh, Depending on the water level, maybe you could get away with a quarter, but just you want to slow roll that thing, you know, let it stay down towards the bottom and just hold on. If there's smallmouth around, um, they'll whack it. The other thing is scent. You know, I think you you put something stinky on your bait and dirty water. Um, It's going to it's definitely going to help get you more bites. It's not going to hurt you at all, whether it's smelly jelly, you know, something crawfish scented garlic, just anything you can put on that bait. That's going to give it uh, more presence is mm-hmm. definitely help. Right. So we talked a little bit about summer, obviously based on the, the conditions throughout the year, winter time, you know, where I'm going with this is you, you can pretty much fish that river year round. If you can get out there, is that correct? Yeah. As long as there's no ice, as long as there's no ice, you can fish there year round. How does how does the the fish position themselves throughout the year? Is it is it do you see a big difference or are they do you catch a lot of fish in the same places year round? It seems like we're catching a lot of fish in the same places year round now. It used mm-hmm. to, um, you know, there was uh, just classic wintering holes for the most part. Like the Susquehanna, it's it is a very shallow, rocky river and deep water, and the natural flowing part of the river that i fish which would be like from harrisburg to sunbury deep water is going to be 10 to 15 feet there's not a whole lot of areas that have deeper water than that and there's very you know there's only like three or four areas that i can think of that have deep water like that so it used to be that getting into the you know colder weather months you know water temperature dropping down into the mid to low 40s all those fish all the smallmouth would kind of pile into the the deeper water areas 
And they really became community fishing holes, you know, just an easy place for guys to just go whack on smallmouth all day long. Uh, you know, Fort Hunter guys watching, they're going to recognize that name, but over the past couple of years, and, you know, we've talked about this, um, there's been a huge invasion of flathead catfish that have kind of, uh, occupied those areas. And it doesn't seem like the smallmouth. I mean, guys will still go in there and catch some smallmouth in those deeper wintering holes, but not like they used to not mm -hmm. at all. So I kind of find, I, I just feel like there's, you know, the fish are close to the same areas. You might've even caught them over the summer until that water gets down into like the, like 35, 34, you know, then they're going to just find the deepest water that is in that area. And it's crazy. I mean, I think some of these fish might even winter in like five, six feet of water. If there's... Mm -hmm soft water or current break, you know, the bottom's right. They might lay in that and not go into, you know, those deeper areas so much anymore. Um, that's kind of what I'm seeing, but you're not going to catch, you know, in the cold water, you're not going to catch fish shallow. You're going to catch fish in the deepest, close to the deepest water around in the zone that you're fishing. And you're going to, you know, you're going to have to fish slow. I mean, there's plenty of videos floating around out there and you have some great videos you know, showing cold water fishing techniques. But, you know, if guys are going out in a, a fishy area and not getting bit, first thing I would ask is, you know, are you fishing slow? You know, you can't be bouncing your bait around and moving it real fast like you do over the summer. Um, and cold water, nothing, all the bait, forage, everything like that, nothing moves fast at all. Everything is lethargic and just kind of shut down just because of the water temperature and mm -hmm. want your bait to match that. So you just, you got to fish so slow. It's crazy. I mean, with guiding, uh, you know, if guys aren't having success, I'll, I'll harp on them about fishing slower, fishing slower, whatever. And I see it so many times where a guy will throw out there and have his bait sitting, might not have caught a fish for a little bit and his phone goes off. So he's holding his rod with one hand and he pulls his phone out and he's scrolling and, you know, looking at his notifications and that's what it take. That's what it took for that guy to slow down. Like he mm -hmm. fishing and got distracted and did something else. And all of a sudden you see the tip of his rod bounce and he got a bite. So, you know, that's the big thing with fishing in cold water, but yeah, the Susquehanna is special in the sense that if it doesn't have ice out there, you pretty much can catch fish year round. It's pretty, pretty cool. So you mentioned catfish. You're not a big fan of the flatheads, huh? Uh, you can't, it's like a political thing, man. Or like, <laughs> what do you mean? Uh, there's, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of the catfish because I think it's, um, I, I think they chew up the smallmouth, and I think they've invaded a lot of the territory that, um, the smallmouth live in, but I say, I mean, not political, but, um, there's plenty of people out there that love to catch the things, you know? So if I, if I start talking about going, go out and, you know, harvest all the catfish you can harvest, those guys get upset with, with mm -hmm. me, you know, the same way I'd get upset with some guy if he's talking about going out and killing all the smallmouth. Sure. Um, but it's this, those flathead catfish have definitely had an impact on the numbers of, you know, the, the numbers of smallmouth in the so river. I would hope, time everything balances out but it's kind of like the you know it's the american story um <laughs> smallmouth aren't even really native to the susquehanna river all the fish that are native to the susquehanna don't even really exist out there anymore wow uh, yeah the smallmouth were introduced back in the early 1900s so pretty much everything that's out there now is invasive the carp the catfish the smallmouth um anything you're going to catch out there walleye panfish largemouth um, well what was left in the 1900s then what was in that river what was what native? was native uh striper salmon american what? shad Get out of here sturgeon it's crazy hmm. there's some shad that would come up through but what screwed that what, what screwed everything up there is these were all migratory fish and they they put a there's you're aware of it. You know, the power dams on the lower river, you have Conway, mm -hmm. 
you have a series of power dams. You have the Conowingo Dam, the Holtwood Dam, uh, Safe Harbor Dam. What's the next one? York Haven Dam. Then there's another one up in Harrisburg that I guess isn't too high. Uh, the Dock Street Dam. But they don't have fish ladders on them. And that pretty much killed the migratory patterns of these fish. So they slowly started dwindling, you know, disappearing. And... Um, you know, new species were introduced and kind of took over. That's why I say it's kind of like, unfortunately, it is kind of like the American story. And now the catfish are just being, these flathead catfish are being introduced and, you know, the story just evolves. And I guess our hope would be that everything can coexist. You know, maybe the numbers of smallmouth won't be what they were just a few years ago. But what was it? Because I heard stories of five, six pounders in the 80s and hundreds of fish. Is that true? I don't know. I, I, yeah, the fish were a lot bigger back then. Um, some of that might have been because they were untouched. I mean, if you go back into the 80s, you're talking about a river that you're talking about river fishing that nobody knew much about. Hardly anybody knew much about. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't promoted like it just wasn't on the map it wasn't on tv people didn't know about this so the first guys that went out and started dabbling in this you know this river fishing is you know especially the susquehanna if you could get into these areas that were untouched you know yeah, yeah crazy numbers i mean mm -hmm. crazy numbers like what we see what what you see up at wills maybe the fish weren't as big but there's a guy that i there's an older gentleman named Russell Fuller. He's a local from the Duncan Duncannon area, and he caught a state record smallmouth out of the Susquehanna. And I think it was 1981. He caught a smallmouth out of the Susquehanna that weighed seven pounds, one ounce, which is, I mean, I can't wrap my head around that. I, the biggest smallmouth I've ever seen out of the Susquehanna are like five and a half, you know, five and three quarter pounds. Um, and that was some time ago. Now it, it definitely seems like the size of the fish is going down. And I don't know if that's a direct result from fishing pressure or those catfish. It's not just flathead catfish out there. There's enormous schools, uh, an enormous population of channel catfish and all these fish kind of eat they fight over the same food and the guys that fish the susquehanna that are watching this will know what i'm talking about when i talk about the schools of channel catfish where there'll be like hundreds of them just roaming around like a big vacuum cleaner and eating everything up off the bottom they'll eat the crayfish the bait fish all the little bugs larvae um they just gobble all that stuff up so it it you know, the result there is there's less food for the smallmouth to get real big like they used to, but there's still good sized smallmouth out there. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can catch a four pounder. Since I've been back on the Susquehanna, uh, you know, back from New York, I've been out four times and I caught one. Biggest one I caught so far was four and a half pounds. So mm -hmm. that's a, that's a great smallmouth. That's a personal best smallmouth to a lot of guys across the country. Um, so it's still, it, it is a, it, it's still a very, very special place. So it's interesting. The flatheads might be doing some damage eating, eating the smallmouth as well. Right. But reverse that. Don't the smallmouth eat little baby uh, flatheads? Yes. Yes. I have caught smallmouth that are puking up little baby flatheads, but this was, I, I've only seen it a few times. I think that those flatheads grow so fast. I, I, I mean, it'd be interesting to talk to a biologist and find out how fast those things actually grow. But I would imagine that they grow out of the size that a smallmouth would feed in in half a year. Okay, sure. But a flathead would be like a little stone caddy or a little goby or something like that. That yeah, you would think that. I don't know where those. I, I just don't know the, the deal with, you know, where do those little flatheads live? Where do they go? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would think that that would provide some forage, you know, some a food base for the smallmouth. But I haven't seen it make them huge yet. Right. Well, let's let's talk about baits and, and whatnot. We, we mentioned the swim baits and some of the soft plastics. I know you do a lot of Ned rigging, things like that. Right. Predominantly, what would be, you know, 
I ask this to a lot of our guests. If you had one bait to use for the rest of your life or, or, or for the year, what would that bait be? And uh, I'm interested to hear your take for river smallmouth. You can only throw one bait. What is it? I guess a Ned rig. Sure. If you could Ooh. only have one bait, it would be a Ned rig just because you can catch fish on a Ned rig year round. I mean, you can, you can mm -hmm. catch fish over the summer, fishing it fast, dragging it slow. And you can catch fish, you know, the dead of winter, 33, 34 degree water, you know, throwing a Ned rig out, fishing it real slow. It's just always going to work. But I don't really like that question just because nobody's really going to do that. Nobody really wants to fish a Ned rig year round. You know, there's, I, gonna I would. The yeah. reason why I asked that is I just want to know what your high confidence bait is, you yeah. know, your go-to. If someone's going out there for the first time and they hear this, they I, I want them to be, you know, pretty confident that they know they can pick up a Ned in yeah. a river situation yeah. and probably be able to catch a few good fish. Yeah, Ned rig. You know, we covered a lot as far as what to look for. You know, obviously, those eddies, places out of the current, depending on the – feeding yeah. cycle for the day something else uh, for over the summer that i didn't touch on is shade lines you know you might uh in the morning or in the morning in the evening or on an overcast day you might catch fish around that fast water all day long but if the sun gets high in the sky and it seems like the fish disappeared you might have to change things up and go do something a little different and you know that's another real popular pattern is just going and looking for shade you know and the you might be talking about areas that only have six inches or a foot of water just up underneath, you know, a tree. That's shallow, yeah. Those fish, some of the biggest smallmouth I've caught in the river over the summer have been in less than a foot of water where you pretty much, you know, you'll throw either, you know, swim bait, a spinner bait, top water lure, you'll throw it up in there and it's almost like that fish sees the bait coming and we get, you'll get what you, what we, what we refer to as a splash and crash bite where that bait comes splashes and that freaking fish is crashing on it. Mm -hmm. Bower it. Um, but that's something else you want to look for, uh, as far as the summer goes, summer pattern. Mm -hmm. yeah, do do. You, I imagine you have a pretty, pretty good insect hatch, different insects throughout the year uh, versus a lake. You probably see that a little bit more. Do you see that affecting the bite? Does it slow things down when there's a bunch of bugs or does it get them, get them, uh, get them feeding a little bit heavy? What's your, what's your take on that? And what kind of insects do you have? Or maybe you don't know. Um, yeah, the fly guys, I know a little bit just from talking to fly guys. I cannot, I, I recognize them and I kind of, I know what to do when I see certain ones, but I don't know. Like uh, a damsel fly, which would be like those little blue dragonflies. You'll see those things coming up and the smallmouth eat them. They, mm. if you have like a little spinner that maybe has a little bit of blue in it or like a little Ned rig or some kind of little soft plastic bait that might have a little bit of that color, that fly coming up. There's a lot of, um, uh, what do they call them? Blueback olives. God, the fly, people are going to laugh at me. I don't know nothing about it either. I was just curious. Um, there is, there's, there's. Does it ever hurt the bite because there's so much food? If you don't dot, if you don't change the pattern, um, if you don't change your presentation or kind of match the hatch, you know, if there's flies coming up and you see fish ringing, you know, if you see if later on in the evening or, you know, different times of the year, it might even happen during the day. If it's calm out, slick, you know, glass-like water, you'll see little dimples all over the water. And those are flies coming up to this. Those flies hatch as larvae on the bottom of the river, float up, spread their wings, and fly away. And you'll see that little dimple from that. And those smallmouth will come up. And sometimes the dimples are actually fish eating the bugs. Mm -hmm. But if you see that, you're going to want to throw, well, throw close to those dimples. I mean, you could just wait for a dimple to happen and throw at it, but start throwing small stuff. Um, you know, tiny little stuff that maybe matches the color of the flies. Uh, but I've also seen it happen where if you see, you know, small mouth ringing, you could throw a spinner bait real close to that ring and, you know, you mm -hmm. can that fish to react real quick. But yeah, the Susquehanna has a huge, um, of, it's very, there's a lot of insects, you know, flies, um, 
caddis flies, may flies, uh, tragos. At some of these, I'm not going to be pronouncing right, but for the fly guys that are familiar with these, that maybe know patterns, there's a lot of guys that fly fish for smallmouth. There's a guy I know oh, yeah. that, you know, over the summer, that's the only way he fishes for them. And he catches, he whacks the snot out of them. He's not always catching the biggest ones, but, you know, he says he can catch a hundred fish a day if he's in the right area on flies. And you know, that's, you know, those, he's mm -hmm. targeting fish that are feeding on little insects, you know, coming up and flying away. Man. Special river. I, yeah, it is. I've been there. I fished with you. It, it's a unique experience. It's, it's neat. You know, it's, uh, for the lake guys, the big water guys, it's certainly a change of, uh, scenery and pace and a whole different level of fishing yeah, it might, might seem easier, but it's not. Uh, there's still a lot that goes into it. Like you said, learning how to read the water is the most important, right? Learning how the learning the currents, learning the patterns, you know, the, the obvious fish structure is all over the place. That's part of the problem with that river is there's so much good looking yeah. stuff. Yeah. You pretty much have to pick an area and just commit to that area and just write down, you know, remember what worked there, but go the whole way across it, pick everything apart and just, it's kind of like eating an elephant one bite at a time. I mean, if you get really frustrated and discouraged, maybe you want to pick up and run somewhere else. But I I generally like to just kind of dissect certain areas, you know, go through and through, pick mm -hmm. it apart. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your experience on big water because, you know, you've been on the Susquehanna for years. Well, actually, before we get to that, I have one question I've been, I've been curious about. You mentioned Z-Man, the love of Z-Man, the finesse baits that they have and the buoyancy of their plastics and how durable they are. But Z-Man wasn't around 15 years ago. What were you guys using? What was the bait of choice back then? Man, it's crazy. I can't even imagine if if, if you would have been the only guy back then that had Z-Man, it would have been like fishing live bait. But the fish were just dumber back then. Right. <laughs> uh, tubes you know, tubes for the, if you would ask me, you know, that one bait, you know, what's your one bait? If you would ask me that question 10 years ago, I would have told you a tube. That's the mm. bait that you can catch fish on year round and they still do work. But, um, I just feel like it's, maybe it'll come back around. Maybe all the fish will get sick of seeing this Z-Man stuff and then they'll start eating the old, just regular plastisol baits again, but tubes, Sankos, you know, spinner baits have always been really good. I, we've always messed around with swim baits, um, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like stuff like that. I, I, you know, when I first started really fishing the Susquehanna hard, I was a tube fisherman. I would fish sure. it year long and just fish it slow on a spinning rod and bounce well, it around. Wouldn't you? Yeah, as long as you had something that was more like a crawfish color, you know, a natural green pumpkin, you know get a flake that maybe matches the tint of the claws or whatever the tint of the crawfish and you could catch fish on that year round and big fish small fish you know is a great way to catch them mm -hmm. so let's talk real quick about some of your experience fishing other big bodies of water because you ventured off from the susquehanna you you do like to fish up on the st lawrence now a little bit right obviously it's a river system but totally different um you just want to touch base a little bit tell us tell us uh your experience there interesting the sus the, the st lawrence is you go from so the susquehanna i should say you're fishing visual stuff you know you're fishing current lines and rocks or maybe a submerged rock that's putting a boil on the surface you know stuff that you can see with your eyes out in front of you and when you go up onto the st lawrence you're pretty much still targeting those same areas but you have to use your electronics to find that structure that's holding the fish and it might be um uh, you know it's just a lot deeper it's a different game the, it's they're the same fish they eat the same baits you're going to need a lot more weight to get down to them but once you, you find the structure that's holding them if you can present your bait right i mean you'll catch them the saint lawrence it's crazy like the saint lawrence is list i don't know if it's still listed but it, you know you know we all know it was listed as the number one bass fishery in the country recently and 
you know, for, there's a lot of guys that go up there and think that they're going to be able to just whack on them all day long. And they find out that that place is not easy to fish at all. Like you can't go up there and the, you might be able to go up there around the spawn and catch fish on beds and, you know, be a hero and, you know, have a lot of fun. But when those fish go deep, it is not, it's not an easy deal. You need electronics, you need mapping and you need to have a good idea where you're going to start because it's a monster river. It's freaking huge. The, the St. Lawrence compared to the Susquehanna, I mean, is unbelievable. The average flow, it, this, I mean, a lot of people don't realize how much water is actually going through that system. And I did a little research picking through it. The Susquehanna drains out 27,000 square miles of land. The St. Lawrence River drains out I think it's 550,000 square miles. It's the drainage for the entire Great Lake system. It runs an average of 350,000 cubic feet per second of water. The Susquehanna on average runs like 10 to 15,000. Mm, wow. So, I mean, it's the difference there. The amount of water going through that system is just mind blowing, bending. It's huge. And there aren't just fish everywhere. They're, they're keyed in to certain areas and you know maybe guys will catch, get lucky and catch some shallow but for the most part you're going to need your electronics and you're going to need good mapping to to find them and you know that was the hardest thing for me up there was transitioning from being a shallow water fisherman you know fishing that all that stuff that you can see with your eyes right out in front of you to this isn't working anymore man i gotta i gotta do something different and you know, making that change. And, you know, fortunately a, a few guys that, you know, local guys kind of helped me get tuned into it, but you know, that's the big deal up there for the most part is, you know, you gotta be dialed mm -hmm. in electronics. Right but on. Same way, the same baits, the same, you know, Ned rigs, swim baits, uh, you know, the drop shot comes into play a lot more up there. The difference there, the difference is you're just using a lot more weight, you know, for the most part in the Susquehanna, I'm throwing an eight ounce to a quarter ounce and up there on the St. Lawrence, you know, you're throwing three eighths of an ounce to five eighths, you know, three quarters. You need a lot of weight to get down there, you know, get down, mm -hmm. get down there to where the fish are at. Yeah. Good stuff, man. This was, uh, it's interesting. I, I know whenever I get the chance to fish something different like the Susquehanna or, and just really a river in particular, I enjoy it. It's a weakness of mine. I prefer the deep, deep, clear bodies of water, inland lakes over a river system, but it certainly, uh, it certainly does have its, its time and can be a, a fun way to put some good smallmouth in the boat. Joe, yeah. how can people uh, follow you on social media and get a hold if they're interested in, in possibly uh, booking a guide trip with you? Okay. So, Google, you can find, if you want to do some research on Susquehanna Smallmouth Guides or me, you can just Google my name or Susquehanna Smallmouth Guides. We have a website that has a lot of information. If you do want to follow me on social media, I have an Instagram, same deal, Joe Raymond, Susquehanna Smallmouth Guide, uh, and Facebook, same deal. I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Snapchat or any of the other stuff, but mm -hmm. content between on, I, there's enough content between Instagram and Facebook that should answer questions or just kind of show guys what we get into and what we do. Awesome. Well, I can't wait. I'm sure we'll be fishing together a bunch more in the future. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for listening to the program. Thank you, Joe, for coming on and That's sharing cool. your knowledge. Yep. Take care guys. Good luck on the water. Awesome. As always, until next time, we'll see you on the water, Joe. That's how you say that. We'll see, see you, you guys. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.